howdy on this episode of Rolling Rambles. It's raining rambles. It's getting kind of wet over here. And I seem to have adopted a radio announcer voice. That's very interesting. I wonder how this will affect my career in broadcasting. Anyway, enough about that nonsense. Today, somebody, in response to a call for suggestions for what I should do in terms of rambling, asked me specifically about Linux, but I think more generally I should talk about the Unix philosophy. Now, I don't mean Unix as in people who have had their testicles removed. I mean Unix, U-N-I-X, as in the uh, operating system from the 60s, 70s. It's all a little fuzzy to me. But uh, Unix, the underpinning of a lot of modern systems, uh, basically most things that aren't Windows, they run something that at least on some level or another attempts to be like Unix, the original Unix from Bell Labs. And there's a philosophy underpinning that. I believe it's Dennis Ritchie, was it? No, actually. Um, I have notes on this phone. It took me a while to dig something up I could look at really quickly to um, give you these, give you the notes about what it is because there's a lot of very long annoying, boring explanations of the Unix philosophy that go into way more verbose detail. God knows if it's supposed to be for like search engine optimization or what. Um, but it's, it's just really annoying and obnoxious. I don't like it. So because the Unix philosophy doesn't have to be that complicated, I went with a simpler version. Um, the Unix philosophy was for, the, by the way, let me give some credit here. This is from clarasystems.com, K-L-A-R-A, systems. It is an article called Unix philosophy, a quick look at the ideas that made Unix. The tenets of the Unix philosophy. One, make each program do one thing well. To do a new job, build afresh rather than complicate old programs by adding new features. This may be the, <laughs> the one aspect of it. I'm glad it's the first one. It may be the one aspect I have the most to say about. Because I actually took a program fdupes and converted it into a program jdupes that is, I would say, at least as popular, if not more popular, than the original. And in doing so, I've added quite a few features to jdupes that were not present in fdupes, and a lot of them still aren't to this day. fdupes cannot hard link duplicates uh, as of this recording. Um, it's still, maybe I'll add it later um, status. And I think about things like this, and it's like, well, what, what constitutes um, doing something different? Because the purpose of jdupes is to locate duplicates and take actions upon them. If the point of the software is to find duplicate files and take actions upon them, doesn't it make a lot of sense that there would be a lot of features in the form of ways to find the files, choose which files, and what actions to take upon them? What are you supposed to do? You have to do all these different things, ideally, in a duplicate scanning tool. But you could split it out. You could say, well, it's not the duplicate, scanners, duplicate scanning tool's job to say, decide which files should be checked for duplicate scanning. Um, maybe filtering out the list of files should be done by another tool. You could say that, but then consider how much more complicated it would be to have another tool do that. It, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense, to be completely honest. Um, why would you not have the duplicate scanner pick files, especially when the criteria in question are criteria that may be decided by the duplicate scanner itself or determined by it. For example, do you really need the duplicate scanner to be fed with a list of files from somewhere else, like some other utility feed it a list of files? No. No, you let the scanner read the directory itself. Because you can break this concept of, if you're going to do something different, make a new tool for it. You can break it in a lot of different ways. You can break it down to the most fundamental elements where it's almost like your utilities are just library calls and they don't do very much by themselves and you have to know how to string them all together. But that's actually very user hostile. It's not very useful to have, for example, 
um, your, your tool, let's say you use the find tool and the find tool, all it can do is print a list of files. Now the find tool is commonly used to print a list of files and subdirectories and all that beneath the current one or whatever one you happen to point it to. But imagine if you will, that find only prints files and it doesn't let you say, Oh, don't, don't print files, uh, based on, you know, a maximum depth. This is actually one of the core features of find is minimum and maximum directory depth. So you can say max depth two, which only lists the things that are uh, basically beneath this directory and um, the ones below it and not any further down. So it only recurses so far into a directory tree and then stops. Well, is that the purview of find or should that be relegated to uh, some other tool? Should that instead be a function of the cut tool, another tool commonly used in Linux and Unix systems that lets you take a field separator and split a, every line of text up based on those field separators. You could use the cut tool to do the same thing as find. You can do cut um, dash D forward slash space uh, dash F space. Uh, you don't have to put a space, but like dash F three, for example, or three dash, and that picks every field three and later. Um, or you could do cut uh, D slash F, um, you know, F, uh, what, like one through three. Um, I think that one, two, three, yeah, that would, uh, that would get you, actually one through four would get you a max depth of two um, because you have to account for the um, beginning, the trailing, yeah, anyway, uh, the point is that you can use find to print the files, the raw files, and then use cut to slice off everything past a certain point. Now the problem is that you still have, now you have duplicate lines um, for each of those directories because you've sliced off every file beneath them. So now you have multiple lines. So now you might have to sort it and use unique to cut out the duplicates. Or you can just have find, have a feature that lets it not go further down than two levels. And then you don't have to cut and sort and unique and all that. You don't have to mess with it. Find already doesn't do the work, which also means since it's not recursing further, it runs faster because it doesn't have to go further down if you don't want it to. So you have that choice and that choice can improve the functionality of the program. So there are ways to do a lot of this extra functionality or bloat with other tools. And those ways are stupid <laughs> because it makes a lot more sense for find to be able to just say, okay, we've gone two directories down in the structure. We shouldn't go any further. We're not going to do that extra work rather than doing the extra work and filtering the result. That's dumb. <clears throat> but a reading of the Unix philosophy is ambiguous. It can be argued that find choosing the depth of the files that it scans into is bloat and that you should do it another way. Like, oh, why do you have this bloat in find? But it's not there for no reason. It's there because it does enhance the functionality of find. Limiting what find does is within the scope of find. But the Unix philosophy could be read or misread as some may choose to interpret it to mean find shouldn't be able to specify depth. You should pass that on to another tool whose job it is to trim that stuff down. Never mind the fact that find lets you execute programs, delete files, and all kinds of other stuff. There's all these other factors that can go into it. Is it find's job to delete files? Is it find's job to run programs for everything entered? I mean, arguably, no. Why aren't you piping find to a while loop in your shell? You know, <laughs> there's a lot of different ways to do it. <clears throat> but piping find to a while loop in the shell is way less efficient than having find run RM whatever on a big group of files, or even just having it run a bunch of RMs on its own, or even better, using the action in find delete and find just does the delete for you. And you don't have to do it yourself. You don't have to invoke a bunch of RM commands separately. 
It's all done within find. But, but the Unix philosophy, does the Unix philosophy allow this? I would say yes. And that's the thing is the Unix philosophy is not some sort of hard and fast set of rules. It's more of a set of general guidelines for building a system. So when we interpret this, we have to interpret it liberally and, and with some degree of flexibility. So find being able to do these things, even though um, it's not central to the core functionality of find, it makes a lot of sense for it to do these things. So of course, having that functionality should be, it should be there. It, it's pretty ridiculous to think that you would cut out the max depth feature, for example, or the delete action. Um, because these things, while not absolutely 100% mandatory to achieve the functionality, they do function far better than the alternative that some weirdo purists might say adheres to the Unix philosophy better, but in reality, it's just stupid and runs worse. So, let's move on. Oh, by the way, an example of adding new features. Um, I do actually tell some people who ask me to add certain features to JDupes that if they want those features, they should probably use a custom shell script to do them instead. There are some kind of strange things that people want to do. And I recognize that at some point, um, th there's a philosophy, um, it's not a philosophy, it's more of a, more of a law or a standard or whatever that all programs will balloon in size and features until they can eventually read email. And that's kind of the problem is that while I think it is central to a duplicate scanner to be able to exclude files on a lot of different bases, I do not think that some sort of advanced pile of criteria, that that's not necessarily the purview of the duplicate scanner. At some point, your really strange niche requirements don't actually make sense to put in the duplicate scanner tool itself. You should be taking the duplicate scanner, using it to make a list of candidates that are duplicates, and then processing those duplicates with custom stuff that suits your workflow. It doesn't make sense to code a feature that two people will use ever. Um, that's a lot of wasted effort. If something is going to take less time to put together a bespoke solution for than it would take to um, write the automation, then it doesn't make sense to write the automation. So there is a degree, um, there is a degree of feature creep that just goes too far and violates the Unix philosophy. System D is a prime example of a tool that is the polar opposite of what the Unix philosophy says in this regard. System D is often, um, the, its, its defenders will very loudly scream that, but system D is not one program, it's a whole suite of programs. Except it's not. It's a suite of programs and they all are interdependent. Now granted, you can probably extract some of the binaries and use them separately, but it doesn't make much sense to. It, it's all kind of, you have to have the other ones around or it doesn't really work. System D is a bunch of stuff masquerade, it's one program, one massive program, masquerading as a bunch of smaller programs, um, probably largely so that people can defend it against very reasonable criticisms that it, it basically is its own uh, little user land all by itself. Now, I mean, the system D's got a networking, you know, it's got networking and DHCP and DNS and authentication and password stuff. It's just, way too much stuff for one program or suite of programs for that matter. It, sh it just should not be there. So system D is basically the king of violating the Unix philosophy. And we've suffered for it. It's a big hulking monolith that has a whole lot of security issues. Um, some of which have been made more clear more recently, um, especially in light of some of the Linux backdoors and vulnerabilities that have come out. <clears throat> um, you don't see many people having to worry about that, uh, what is it, the, I think it's XZ and it's open SSH. It's, yeah, System D was kind of a critical part of that. So anyway, 
Uh, system D is bad because it violates the Unix philosophy and as a result it's hard to test, it's hard to debug, it's, it's hard to make sure that it's actually safe and when it misbehaves um, you're, you're kind of screwed. It's not a simple tool, it's a big monolithic disaster pretending to be simple tools. Number two, number two, expect the output of every program to become the input to another, as yet unknown, program. Don't clutter output with extraneous information. Avoid stringent columnar or binary input formats. Don't insist on interactive input. What this means is basically everything is a text file. You have to assume that your program will be part of a pipeline at some point. Write programs so that other programs can feed that program information and receive information from that program in a consistent format that is easy to understand. Uh, if you, for example, um, here's another good example of that. JDupes, um, maybe this is not the best example, but JDupes has a hash database feature. I did not put SQLite or some other ready-made database engine in. I rolled my own um, database format. I did this for a variety of reasons. Um, frankly, performance is the biggest, but the fact that it dumps a text file and not an SQLite database, um, it, it's just a straight text file that operates on a line-by-line -line basis for every file, that was important to me. It, it has columns, <clears throat> and while it is not perfect, um, the column format does insist on some strictness. There is There are fixed length strings in this format. Part of it is just so it looks better. Part of it is because it's much easier to shovel the data in and out if it's, you know, like hexadecimal numbers. Um, if, if it's a 64-bit number, it's easier to store that as eight bytes of text instead of trimming the leading zeros from it. It's easier to keep a more rigid format for that it also means that the database file um, can be processed very quickly because every line that's read in, everything is in a fixed location and width until the file name. Now, to some extent, obviously, this format violates the philosophy in that it is a rigid column format, but there are reasons for it, um, and it's a text file. It uses a very simple line-by-line -line format. Um, the first line is version information, and then every other line past that is one file per line. And that format is much easier to work with than a binary file. I could store, for example, I could store a line in binary format and have every number just be stored as the raw values because it's fixed width anyway, I could just store the numbers as raw values and then continue scanning until I hit a new line for the file name. I could do this. It would actually be a lot faster because now there's no hexadecimal um, to actual number conversion going on under the hood for hundreds of thousands potentially of hexadecimal numbers. But, but, the big advantage of not having this binary format is that now I can work with it using standard text processing tools. As seen in a shell script I wrote, a quick and dirty little problem solver that's in the JDoop source code called remove hash db dead entries dot sh or something like that. It takes every line of the shell script it trims off all the beginning information and only takes the file path at the end. It sorts it so that it's faster because it's faster to read the same directory than to jump around to a bunch of them. And because of the way hashing works, the, um, the list is not sorted. It's not pre-sorted. So it has to be sorted before processing to take advantage of um, faster directory reads. But anyway, it takes every file that's in the list, sorts them, and then checks to see if they exist. If they exist, the new file gets a copy of that line. If they do not exist, it just throws away the old line, and that's it. It trims anything from the hash database that no longer exists. 
because it's in this format, I don't have to do weird stuff. I don't have to like DD out the sections. I can just say cut at this field separator. I think it's a colon if I remember correctly. Uh, but cut at this field separator all the way to the end. And the cut command does it all for me. Um, and I don't have to write a special tool to deal with the binary format. This is contrary to, uh, say, SystemD's journaling, which is in a binary format, ostensibly for speed, but that makes the uh, actual log data pretty much opaque. You can't do anything with it without using the specific tools included in SystemD, which also means you can't use better tools. Everything relies on stuff that can parse this binary format. So you're locked into this restricted set of utilities. It's really crappy. Again, System D is the anti-Unix philosophy program pile of crap. Uh, that this is why being able to take textual input and spit out textual output that's fairly consistent is important. Let me give you an example of a program I use in a way that the authors never would have really expected. And I am locked into an old version because of this, because they change behavior, but I have a script in my TriTech Utilities, which are available on Codeberg, um, on my J. Bruchon Codeberg. Look, look up TriTech-Utils, T-R-I-T-E-C-H. And you'll find a script in there called TT underscore image drop. It relies on a few things. One of them is FDisk. Not a new FDisk, but old FDisks that don't know anything about GPT. Because if you drop an image that I've pre-created that has classic MBR style boot record partitioning and all that. If you drop one, one of those images using this shell script, the way that it manipulates the partition table, and I know that this is, this is nasty and the SF disk is probably a better tool for the, for the purpose. At the time, the quickest way to manipulate it was simply to feed the commands that would be appropriate to F disk as if I was typing them in. So I know for a fact if I open up the disk drive in FDisk after you know dropping just a raw image at the beginning, it's gonna have the partitions, but they're gonna be shrunk. So I know I need to delete and recreate and so on and so forth. And there are some assumptions made, but basically the script knows to tell FDisk, you know, FDisk this drive, and then it's like D2 NP2 T7 you know, and it, it, you get the idea. It it no it punches out the commands as if they were typed. Then it handles the resize with NTFS resize afterwards, and that's it. Um, it's not the way that the program is supposed to be used. It's supposed to be an interactive program, and I use it non-interactively. It has worked for about 15, 14, 14 or 15 years. It has worked perfectly fine. No issue. So they never would have guessed, but it works because the FDisk program adheres to the Unix philosophy. A program that does not adhere to the Unix philosophy, unfortunately, is chntpw, the change nt password command. I found this out because I was trying to write a shell script that would automatically go in and feed the um, feed the program commands to clear Windows passwords non-interactively. And then I found out it's not so simple. It misbehaves if you feed it from not an interactive terminal. So I, eh, that kind of destroyed my efforts right there. And to this day, I do not have an automatic password blanking system for Windows, mostly because I gave up after that didn't work out. I was a little, you know, mildly upset, but whatever. Um, but because that program did not behave non-interactively, um, it shot down my ability to use it in a pipeline, which meant I couldn't write a new tool that relied on it as part of that pipeline. Which means if I need to clear a password for Windows NT, which is basically all modern Windows system, then I had no choice but to run this program interactively and do everything the hard way. Ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Let's move on. Number three, 
Design and build software, even operating systems, to be tried early, ideally within weeks. Don't hesitate to throw away the clumsy parts and rebuild them. This is a philosophy that is very well known in software programming today, um, in development. It is basically called um, break, break early or fail early and, and fail often. Uh, you basically want to, if you're going to have a problem, you want to find out that you have a problem quick. Don't write a massive piece of software that is never going to see the light of day and nobody's going to test it for a long, long time and only after you're done spending a year on it do you discover that there's some major flaw that now you've built a bunch of technical debt around and you have a serious problem. I do realize this sort of flies in the face of me saying, I want to make a new operating system, but I want to keep the source closed and not let anybody see it for a long time until it's really ready to go. Yes, yes, it is at odds with that. And, and yeah, there are some ways to mitigate it. But anyway, you know, fail early and fail often is not a bad thing. Because the problem is if the failure is going to happen, it's going to happen regardless of how long you wait to find out that it's going to happen. So you may as well know about it early when you can do something about it before it becomes entrenched. Not much to say there. Um, I don't have any good examples of that. Anyway, uh, four, use tools in preference, use tools in preference to, I assume that means in, um, use, prefer to use tools instead of, unskilled help to lighten a programming task. Even if you have to detour to build the tools and expect to throw some of them out after you finish using them. This is basically the automation thing I said earlier. Uh, sometimes it's stupid. It's real stupid to go through and do things manually. Sometimes it makes sense to write a temporary tool to do something and I have a perfect example of this from a very recent job I did. I have a customer who has used Mozilla Thunderbird for well over a decade, like 15 years. Over a decade of emails, stored up on backup drives and an old XP hard drive and whatnot. They are now writing memoirs or something um, and needed to get all the communications between them or just involving a couple of other people. They needed to get these communications out of old Thunderbird mail stores on backups and old system hard drives. So stuff they had no access to. Now I know if I grab the Thunderbird mail stores and I just pull them in um, to Thunderbird in a certain way, I can search them or whatever. So I know that I can make Thunderbird um, dig through her mail for me. However, I didn't want to do that. Partly because I would have to do that with my own stuff. I didn't want to do that with my own stuff. <clears throat> I don't want to attach her email to my email and then have to go dig through it. Um, it would have it would have possibly been easier, but I, I, I didn't want to do it. I just, for a variety of reasons, um, I didn't want to screw with my own mail and I didn't want to set up a temp system. So I'm going through these Thunderbird files and I basically just start just manually just grabbing the messages. I don't know how many there are, but I assume there can't be too many. So I go through and start manually grabbing messages, just, you know, snipping them out using Vim and slapping them in like their own text files in Notepad or something. Um, and I start to realize it's taking a long time to do it. And I go, okay, how can I make this faster? I don't want to drag it into my Thunderbird. I don't want to have to set up a whole other system just to deal with it. And, you know, even then, you know, I, I just want to grab it. I just want to grab it all and throw it somewhere. So what I did was I realized I needed to know the scope of the problem, ran a quick, uh, quick grep over all the Thunderbird files, counted up the instances of from, to, cc, whatever, from this, like, three or four people, and it was hundreds. So I said, screw this, and I wrote a, sh a small shell script that would go through all the mailbox files because all Thunderbird mailbox files are in a specific format where the mail always starts with on a new line with from and you know it's basically just, it always starts every email the same way 
So since it splits at every from whatever header, I could easily do that to find messages. So all I had to do was start capturing at that header, and if I found something matching within the next text, I would save what I had read, and if not, I would just discard it and move on to the next one. It turned out to only be like a 20-line shell script. Um, just, just uses a couple of loops to iterate through the mailbox files and grab any relevant message and spit out a text file with the message inside. And I produced hundreds of text files for her that she could go through and do whatever she wanted with, just plain text, not EML files or anything stupid like that. Plain text. Anything can open it. And, and that's it. You know, I wrote a tool in and tested it and everything in about 15 minutes, and it processed hundreds, hundreds and hundreds of messages. So it makes a lot of sense to automate away things that might take more time if you don't, and to figure out whether or not you should, just look at how long it takes to automate versus how long, how much benefit the automation gives you. It's stupid to take 15 minutes to write and test a short shell script to do, say, say you just need to snip out eight emails, that would be stupid. It would take so little time to run a grep, find the eight emails, you know, what files are they in, and then go dig and just grab the mail. You could do that in five minutes or less, if you're at my skill level at least. Whereas 15 minutes to write a shell script, well, you just wasted a bunch of time. That's 10 extra minutes that you burned that you'll never get back. Um, but 15 minutes to write a shell script when you're dealing with hundreds of emails to be snipped that could take hours and it took you 15 minutes plus the run time. It makes sense. So that's really all that that's saying. So to review, uh, make each program do one thing well. Expect the output to be the input to another and don't expect uh, input to be interactive or rigid. Um, design things to be tried quickly so they can fail and break early and use tools basically automate things um, or you know find some way to automate things uh, instead of doing it the hard way if you can and I think this is a solid philosophy and I think that anybody who knows a lot about system D and how it works and how bad it is and how crappy everything is around it um, can understand and appreciate the Unix philosophy. Um, let's see. And it, I don't think there's much else that I can really talk about here. Those are the main points. But, you know, the Unix philosophy, it is very loose. You should not just strictly do what it says. Um, sometimes it makes a lot of sense to put some, like, wow, that's really weird feature in there. Like, and, you know, JDupes having a hash database feature, for a long time I didn't do it, and sometimes I thought maybe maybe it would make sense to be able to dump one, but, you know, I, just, I, I didn't really want to build, like, some kind of database thing if I didn't have to, and one day I was faced with the fact that I had all these files, I had a huge pile of files, and a lot of work, because they were huge files, a lot of work was being reduplicated. Just over and over, I was scanning gigantic files to hash them. And it could have, if these, if these hashes were stored somewhere in a way that changes could be detected and thus the stored value discarded, uh, but otherwise the stored value be used and that step be skipped, files that might take even, uh, that are big enough to even take a minute or two per file to hash and scan and all that, you could potentially skip that whole process, the whole thing, not need to be hashed and scanned and all that um, to reject the duplicate. So if you have a new file come in and it's the same size as like eight other files, um, those eight other files have already been hashed and the hash has been stored. You got this ninth file come in. Okay, you still have to hash the ninth file, but now you can look at the hash values for the others without looking at all of them individually too. That's eight hashes for huge files that didn't have to be calculated. 
Obviously, JDoops is not a database. It's not a way to hash files, but adding the ability to store the already being calculated hashes and, and keep them across invocations made a humongous difference in performance. So I, I haven't refined that feature, but it made a lot of sense to add it, even though it's not entirely in the wheelhouse of the program. And yeah, the program is getting bigger. It's probably not gonna read mail anytime soon, but I tried to adhere to that philosophy loosely in that I'll add features that make sense in, in the context of I'm trying to find duplicate files. But if we get to the point where we're going beyond merely finding duplicates to doing God knows what else, like I, I don't know, uh, like if we're like modifying files, that, that's probably not, um, that's not exactly something that I want my duplicate scanner to do. I don't really want to have a duplicate scanner that then can use regular expressions to change the contents of files. No, at that point you do feed it to a custom script that uses said or whatever to, to do some kind of rewrite of the text inside the files. It's, it's at some point that, that function belongs to a different tool, but you can end up with a lot of functionality similar to it, um, but not the same if it makes sense in the context of the one thing your program's goal is to accomplish. You know, anyway, <clears throat> I've chatted on long enough about the Unix philosophy. Like, comment, subscribe. You know the dear, you know the drill. You don't need me to tell you three times, but I might anyway if you keep on watching. Why are you still watching? You're waiting to see what I do, aren't you? Well, I don't have anything interesting, so take care. Hang on, what is going on back here? That person has their high beams on. Why do you have your high beams on, dude? What's your problem? Turn your beams off.